Odeyla. represents um, my personal views or whatnot. This is for purposes of a sport um, and we make real arguments. This is not consent, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Like, st- 
stems from the fact that governments do have the right to control curricula to begin with. And to the extent that we think that there is a legitimate end goal out of it, we think to a large extent governments are legitimate in intervening. And this means that, that my principal argument is harm or my, uh, uh, or my practical outcome. Let's talk about this practical outcome. We think the end stage in the, sh in, in the short term, uh, no faculty may be advised. 59, right? We, we think to a large extent, like in the short term, maybe like there, there's going to be some uneasiness, some sort of fear. People aren't really certain about this, and we see there might be some sort of stratification. But we think to a, to the extent that like 40% of white people who still voted for Hillary Clinton, 40% of white Americans still think that Black Lives Matter is largely legitimate. We think to a large extent they are willing to send these things <coughs> to African um, to ACX, right? We think this means that even though we might see some short term. Um, Stratification um, or, or, or the, uh, segregation, we think that um, we think that segregation won't be a particularly big problem. But we think in the long term, this kind of segregation is like is likely to um, like, like likely to um, not exist anymore. Why is that the case? Right? Because as deeper understanding of African American issues um, increase, right? As we understand, as we stop, um, um, what do you call this? Uh, undermining the 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 the. the the, the relevance of the issues that minority groups recognize or face, right? Uh, as we better understand this, this necessarily means that your that your majority committee is one that recognizes the value of social education, okay. recognizes the legitimacy of social education, no thank you, sir. And like and in the long term, this likely means that that these that these white communities are like you said, happy to send their kids to these black school uh, school uh, ACS, for example. And we think to a large extent, um, where, where this becomes part of common culture. Um, African American families don't see the harm of sending their kids to schools that don't necessarily, that don't teach ACS. We think the comparative is this, right? Because in um, in the state of school, we see a lack of legitimacy um, with regard to black issues or whatnot. When 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 we see a lack of legitimacy to black issues, when we see that um, that that. That, that, that um, social movements like Black Lives Matter don't matter, right? Or, or, or claims that, that social movements like Black Lives Matter don't matter anymore because, oh look, we have set up laws that do give you equal rights, that give you equal protections. There's no need for you to try and campaign to act like polygamy, for example. That's the rhetoric that's being used to oppress these people right now. And we think we try to try, we, 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 uh, we are trying to do something about it. They do nothing to stop it because all these issues and the deeper understanding of these issues that only come from a form like from quite a few years of education doesn't. Um, um, that doesn't get fully fleshed out and understood in the wider consciousness of your, of your majority communities. We change that and we think this bolsters legitimacy for minority rights. And second, we argue that this essentially also breaks our prejudice to the extent that we grant greater legitimacy or, or, or a wider majority communities recognize the legitimacy of these minority groups. They also recognize within themselves the sense of privileges and prejudices that they hold. And that necessarily demand, like, like to the extent that we believe people are inherently good, they are likely to change as well. And we think this means we help break down prejudice. I'm proud to propose. Yes, that is true. But we think that 
because the government doesn't have the jurisdiction to tell you exactly what schools you should choose to send your children to. This will become but merely an option. And therefore the counter policy that we're willing that like is coming out of uh, opposition from today is uh, today is that you're going we're going to have a <coughs> neutral history, a neutral type of history being taught in schools. What this means is that we're going to offer you various interpretations and perspectives of history and people can be taught how to interpret these versions as they wish. We think that at the point we get we think that we can teach you both the culture of white people and black people. But at the point when these things are contradictory or conflicting in nature, we think that will then teach both and allow the children to decide which they would rather favor or believe. We think that even if on outside, it doesn't mean that they're going to perhaps buy the opposite side. We think that at least they're fundamentally aware. And why is this principally, and we're going to enforce this and put them in place in all public schools. Let me tell you why this is so important. Because we believe that today, and just like Afrocentrism, only, only teachers, or like the, the people who, at, who attend these schools, things like the culture of that school, or the culture of the African American people, or perhaps the kinds of contributions that they have made. But they will not be able to teach the people the kinds of injustices that the people have, the, that, the injustices that have been committed against the black people by the white people, the point which we only want to focus on things like the kinds of contributions that they have made. I think the, the, the most important thing in this debate, if you really want to create the kinds of, if you really want to create a society that's more accepting, you want to create a society where which your white majority is willing to vote for policies that perhaps favor African American people, or perhaps will allow for some form of affirmative action to occur. This can only happen, we believe, at the point at which these people understand the kind of injustices that they have been served upon these black people, and understand exactly the ways in which they have benefited of the uh, uh, of the slavery, or perhaps of the entrapment of the black people. Again, this can only happen at the point at which this is being taught to the white people as well, and not only the African Americans. They will be willing to go into. They will be willing to send their children into these schools. Everything that because, like, we think that because that understanding is extremely necessary, and the segregate, like we think that, like the kind of segregation that you create, and the point which you create in these schools is very problematic. Yes, sir. Yeah. So why would um, these schools uh, necessarily have an incentive to want to cover these issues deeply or fairly? Because most structural, I, I, I explain why okay. structural reasons. Okay. So reasons. let me tell you why these schools will be more willing to at the point in which when they have an enrollment of African American children, based on a situation where all the Afri African American children go into Afrocentric schools. The, the fundamental reason is because these schools have to cater to the kinds of students that they have within their schools. If, like, even if they do not think it's a fundamental responsibility to do so, we believe that at the point in which you have an African American sitting in class and he's being taught a very whitewashed version of history, he's going to say something. This is because schools aren't the only places where children learn about their histories or their culture. We feel that these things are imparted to them within their household through their families as well. We believe that the point at which the African American child sees that his teacher refuses to talk about something or he says something that is blatantly is like blatantly different from what he necessarily believes in or was brought up knowing. We think that he's going to say something. We think at that point you get a more diverse form of education. But what is the what what is the what is the comparative on their side? We think at the point at which you create these Afrocentric schools, they're going to give rise to the creation of con of these schools that are not Afrocentric, that are convert, that are going to whitewash history to the greatest extent and have and face no opposition at all for it because their student population is going to be filled with white people who completely believe and support this. Why do we think that segregation is so harmful to society? We think that firstly, this is because you limit the kinds of in, you limit the kinds of interaction that happens between white people and black, like white and black children. We recognize that schools are extremely important grounds for people to like for people to interact with one another and for integrate and for racial and religious integration to occur. This is because only within the schools you get the kinds of like the kinds of um the, you are able like, you get you get the kinds of interaction with people of a different community, you get to understand about their culture, you get to understand the differences between both groups. You also, very importantly, humanize these people for the white children. You see that this black child is your friend. You are more willing to hear his story than perhaps what is being taught just by your teacher. At the point which you humanize these people, you allow these people, you allow these people to find that they are know that the racial divisions are perhaps not as serious or not as uplay as what they have been taught in the past. We think that this is the best way in which you can allow integration, you can allow integration to occur. But we also think there's a greater fundamental problem at the point in which you have two different groups of people with believing very different versions of history. We think at the point in which they're teaching them different versions of history, that both groups then have a then have this very strong misunderstanding of perhaps like an incompatible understanding of exactly how should we proceed forward. On the hand of like the black people are then uh, like being taught what they, like the black people and the white people then have a greater misunderstanding between exactly what um uh, exactly what kinds of history and exactly how the country should proceed. We think that it's these kinds of division and these kinds of disagreements that will foster the kind of hate and foster the kinds of misunderstanding between both groups. Um, and this is like, because
because of the fact that different perspectives are being taught to these children, we think that it becomes then far more difficult for them to be able to communicate with one another, to be able to work together towards creating like a society that's more inclusive, simply because the fundamental understandings that they were brought up with are vastly different. We think that it's also, and we think that the very like homogeneous populations racially in these schools also mean that the children necessarily don't get the kinds of exposure to perhaps quell or dis uh, like disprove the kinds of biases or notions that they may have been brought up believing. We think that on our side, we're able to promote the integration better at the point at which understanding occurs, not just not just on one group, but between the two groups, at the point at which the people and like the white people are able to understand and recognize the kinds of injustices that they have like that they have committed in the past is the only way at which they can admit this and, and like change for the better. Liberal parents are a thing. Yes, they support the movement as they claim, but have no 
children probably can't afford private school anyway, and these are individuals who need to go to a school. There are only so many places that are that are in your district that are going to be in Anglo-Saxon schools, and only so many parents who can just up and leave and uproot to another district to go to an Anglo-Saxon school. Just in terms of numbers, there are going to be white people in black schools and vice versa. We think that racial segregation is not as likely as they claim. But even if in the very short term, we think this is not too much of an issue because it's about legitimizing Afrocentrism as an important part of the education to incentivize more people to do so. The only reason why people don't think it's a legitimate point of view as an education right now is because it's not seen as important enough or as legitimate enough in our society and therefore want to move on. What we do on our side by saying our education system recognizes this as a format, as a part of the system, is when you legitimize the value of it and allow for more people to come <coughs> on board. That's how you change when the change the racial segregation. But even if schools are all black, we're okay with legitimizing their history and teaching them that. And we'll talk about that in substantive before that. So on the balance of probability, what is the more urgent need? Blacks not having pride in their own history or white parents not wanting their children to feel like a minority in their own backyard? Yeah, so the reverse is happening right now, right? That black parents feel like their children are a minority in their own back, yeah? So we're okay with some white parents feeling that way as well. We think that the point is to be able to legitimize the Afrocentric education as one that people should be allowed to go to and should be allowed to view. If some parents are going to be upset about it, we think that upsetness happens on both sides and are for different groups of parents and are perfectly fine. On, a sub on the concept of on a subject in every school versus entire schools, we think it's important to bleed into all subjects, right? You have different perspectives of literature text, your history textbook, your geography, your population, your social studies, your psychology. These are all different subjects they take in school, all of which can be viewed in an Afrocentric perspective. They cannot then have just one subject that deals with this. Because having a single subject trivializes it as a thing and that they have to memorize and regurgitate for an exam and not as an interpretation of an entire worldview. We think that that worldview is important to the kinds of rights that these individuals get in the first place. So why are Afri Afrocentric schools important or beneficial to the African American community? We think that at the end of the day, the African American community today feels like they are second class only because they are learning everything from the perspective of the whitewashers. Not just the fact that they have a history or a culture, but the fact that their own contributions to society or their own perspectives of the world always come in secondary or as one page of a textbook rather than as the entire textbook. We think it's important to be able to legitimize their self, legitimize their stories, legitimize their survival as a point of view and not as a subject, as a way of living, as a lifestyle and not as something that's just something to memorize and regurgitate into an exam. We think therefore it's important for these schools to exist because you legitimize their existence, their history, their ancestors for who they were as being a legitimate version of the society to accept diversity. That is why the education system exists in the first place, why we allow for private schools, why we allow for religious schools or sports schools or science schools because we legitimize those as various versions of education that are important and that are legitimate for the progress of our nation. Why is this important specifically in this era or in this society? We think today is a world where we see no progress in racial rights because people assume that everything is fine and dandy as long as we have the word equality in our laws. These small microaggressions change when you're allowed to see things from a different perspective or a different point of view that only exists when you legitimize their education, you legitimize their form of living. We propose. are in fact very diluted. So, as to the extent that we can prove that segregation does happen, I think a lot of OG's case does fall flat. So let's talk about why then that is the case. First of all, like 
we must have, like, Bihar's own examples about sports schools and religious schools are quite funny, right? Because the only people that attend these religious schools, for example, are people who buy into their religion, are people who are religious themselves, right? If you look at sports schools, only an athlete goes to sports schools. You don't see other people going to sports schools, for example, right? We think that that's precisely what's going to happen. But then she had a more mathematical explanation to say, look, there's like so, number, so many number of public schools that you can go to, right? You can't uproot your life and go somewhere else just to seek another school. First of all, let's explain that like in this motion, it still talks very specifically about a creation of additional schools to the current schools that you already have. To the extent that you're creating more schools, i.e. creating more capacity, we think there's definitely an alternative within your neighbourhood. Why then are people more likely to choose their neighbourhood? The the, we need to analyse this in terms of the groups of people. The first people are the kinds that are inherently racist themselves, right? People who are fundamentally opposed to the kind of things that ACS will teach. These people will go to extra lengths to really uproot their lives to move to another town if necessary. But more importantly, right, I think it's important that these are the target group that they wanted to have. These are the people that we most needed to convince in order to advance the rights, uh, uh, rights of minorities in society. And it's important to note, therefore, that if they don't have these people <coughs> within their schools, then a lot of their benefit is diluted. But the second group of people are people who are perhaps already like don't mind, uh, like uh, don't, uh, already support things like Black Lives Matter. The problem, therefore, is that if they don't attend, uh, if they do attend these schools and they're not together with their other white counterparts, we think it's particularly bad because they are in the best position to convince their white people that black people are indeed, uh, uh, are indeed uh, deserving of more rights, are indeed deserving of better positions in society. Do you accept that on our side, that our kind of like influence will also be slow? Yes, we do. But we think that to the extent that they're going to create segregate, uh, a segregated and a different audience altogether, we think one of, first of all, they don't, uh, they also, uh, they necessarily create a disjoint in the kind of histories. Something that Nicole talked about. Why is it important uh, to, uh, to note this point? Because we say that when there's a disjoint in histories or the understanding of, 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 the, of like culture in the past, we say these are likely to uh, the, the affect the formation of current policies and current politics. But the question therefore is who is likely to have more sway in current politics? We say it's more likely to be people from white communities and therefore the, other, the alternative schools to theirs, they have, and, and, and there are people in their community that has more power to influence these things. We think that's particularly bad. Go ahead. In the comparative, both sides are going to have racist people who don't learn anything. Why is the quality of the Afrocentric education you get going to change the liberal white people's perspective to get a change in society? Okay, a couple of things, right? So, the, uh, actually, I'm just going to move into that. I think the first thing we need to take to take note, right, is that, first of all, I think it's a principal importance that we at least get them to confront the history behind, uh, behind what has happened in the past, right? When Nicole talked to you about nature history and when, and when they, like, glibly, like, denied that that was ever possible, we're talking about, like, being able to present facts to people, right? For example, saying that you have previously enslaved people is a fact. These are things that can be presented, right? And we say that that's impo it's important for people to at least confront these things and acknowledge that there has been injustice to begin with. We say that it's only with a step of acknowledging injustice do we then create a sense of obligation towards create changing society for the better, right? But we, but also very strangely, right? Wilson said in his own speech that governments have the right to, to, to govern state narratives, right? If that is true and we accept what Wilson says, then necessarily uh, like introducing more forms of Afrocentrism must be possible on our side as well, right? So we, are, so then they glibly try to say that look, like these are children, they can't possibly create more engagement in the classroom, right? Sure, if we're talking about primary school, but I think towards secondary school or more tertiary forms of education, it is very, it is, it is very naive to say that these people won't challenge the kind of things in their classrooms, right? I think that they become a lot more outspoken as they grow up and they are able to at least present these things to their white counterparts. The comparative is this, the people that they want to convince are not even in that classrooms, right? So on the balance of things, at least on the comparison, we do get an additional advantage. But what's particularly dangerous about their policy is that they tend to hide the problem, right? And this is extension of material, right? It is true that they feel more accepted in these ACS schools. It is true that they also feel more empowered in these uh, uh, ACS schools. But the problem is this, that they, are, that, they only that they only exist within the confines of that school, right? Empowerment stops there. 
Why? Because, this, because to the extent that these schools are created, the state is able to say that, look, we do care about you, right? We do, uh, we do, enshrine, uh, we do care about your views. But to the extent that the state does not encompass this in politics or in law, we think that's particularly dangerous. It's just under, educa uh, uh, it's just under education, and then, uh, and then the kind of legitimizing of view does not have a practical impact or tangible impact on changing the lives of these people, right? It is drastically different when they begin to leave these schools and realize that actually their culture is not at all empowered. When the number of white people that they meet that do not understand their culture outside of these schools begin to overwhelm them and they understand that they indeed do not have power. We say that they hide the problem because they show up, and then uh, because they uh, just because the state uh, the state shows they care. But more importantly, right, what's going to be the perception of these schools? These schools are going to be written as schools that teach an alternative history. They are not uh, they are, they're, they're, number one is drastically different. But we say that these schools are going to be priced a lot less and less a lot less privileged than the, the, the other types of schools that we wanted to talk about, right? They're going to be cast as second class schools, and we say that that's the kind of uh, so even if you legitimize your view, the kind of perception in society is that they're still a lot less worthy, right? We say that that's particularly dangerous because we, uh, we uh, this uh, because we say the guys the guys the problem and therefore uh, like st stinters any stifles any kind of real change in the future. Lastly, I want to deal with this idea that uh, we also talked about about how social movements are being uh, a lot less legitimate because of the lack of history. There is no <coughs> thing between educating people about history and saying current laws are not enough. We say that to the extent that one convince people that current laws are not enough, then we say you must appeal to a broad base of people and tell them that the, current, uh, the status quo is simply not enough, there needs to be a change of laws, and that's how we convince people on our side of the house. We probably have books. Before we start this debate, closing government will tell you what ACS actually looks like. For example, in this, we will study great African American figures. So we will focus not only on the big ones like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, or Malcolm X, which everyone knows, but we will focus even on fringe African figures like Angela Davis, like James Baldwin, Madam Chair, which we think played a huge role in that of American history. We will also focus not only on African Americans, but African figures as a whole. We're talking about Shaka, for example, the Zulu Empire. Uh, we're talking even, for example, like Robert Mugabe, Gandhi. I mean, not Gandhi, sorry, Mandela, Mandela. <laughs> but Nelson Mandela, focusing on their roles in, uh, and their ability to shape world history as a whole. In contrast, notice in the status quo, even in America, majority of the curriculums are majority overwhelmingly white centric. You learn about Mills, Bentham, Aristotle, and Socrates, which all interestingly look really white, but you never, for example, explore like the ideas and concepts of individuals of other races. The idea here is to surround students in this school with African uh, culture, with a special focus on African American culture. More importantly, I'd like to make one distinction. It is impossible to talk about the history of African American people without understanding that their struggle against the state itself is integral towards their struggle. So for example, there will be a lot more focus, for example, upon how the state itself was the perpetrator of much racist policies in the status quo. You will talk about how in Jim Crow, for example, was anchored and embodied by the state in perpetuating this racism. This is going to be extremely important later on in my speech. Now, moving on to our extension, correct? I think in the status quo, the greatest impediment to racial equality in the status quo is the concept of white fragility, where white Americans see themselves fundamentally impossible of being racist, where a majority of white Americans still simply deny the idea that racism is a predominant problem in the status quo. The reason that this occurs is that racism in the status quo is falsely thought as an issue solely of moral and immoral 
individual people rather than an issue deeply embedded in America's systems and institutions. We misconstrue racism as easily identifiable singular acts, such as using racist slurs like hate speech, which I will not name examples, or hate crimes, for example, because we uh, uh, are singular easily identifiable acts. This means people with good morals, out, uh, good morals, ultimately have see themselves as avoiding this stigma, are incapable of being racist. More importantly, notice that when white Americans are called out for unconscious racist acts, like for example supporting a white loving president, white people perceive this as being called immoral. This explains, for example, much of their defensiveness and much of their inability to recognize what even racism looks like. Not the fact, for example, that you use the N-word, but the fact that you support certain institutions and those institutions fundamentally oppress race-based uh, like, uh, people of color within your own country. I sense this is a clarification, but yeah. Um, so if your premise is that the underlying forms of discrimination are already so prevalent, what is the supervening factor of these segregated schools that changes this, this position or changes so radically the situation that's happening? Yeah, 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 I'm getting good. Okay, so more importantly, right, notice for example that like it's about the structures and the way that they were taught in the status quo. This explains like this explains the incredible defensiveness and insistency and never acknowledging that race is a problem in America. How then do we solve this problem? For example, when you teach the white people to confront the fact that the state was the central perpetrator of race-based violence and oppression in the status quo, you naturally change their worldview, for example, at seeing racism no longer as a singular act. For example, Madam Chair, if you notice and you realize that what happened in the Jim Crow area, uh, no, not Jim Crow area, what happened like in the past was there were many African Americans who were fleeing from the South towards the North where they thought they would be free individuals. The state actually levied one massive amount of estate tax upon these individuals, but two, what they actually did was to actively sell property at higher prices towards these African American individuals. What they entered into was, like, oh, okay, I'm not going to go into the legal parts of it, but basically they entered into a contract that was unable to be enforced within the court themselves, and the state, even recognizing this problem, never provided, uh, actively withheld it, judicial assistance or withheld policies towards helping these African Americans at that point in, t at that point in time. Notice at this point in time, realize that racism is ultimately socialized towards these structures and institutions within the status quo. By one, focusing on these particular struggles, you ultimately do a few things. One, you create more political capital within these particular students and hopefully within the wider public as a whole to support like important affirmative action that are inherently race-based. Things like reparations, for example, have been told by many African-American thinkers as essential towards equalizing the idea of race <coughs> in America, but never had enough political will in the status quo to pass. We hopefully solve that when students themselves learn the full plight and full depth of how their state, which they so love, and a nation which they so patriotically like oddly cherish, was the one that perpetuates these kinds of race-based oppression in the first place. Secondly, for example, we think that at the point in time that we are able to get them to see themselves as racist, because racism, for example, is a highly socialized behavior by institutions and structures rather than a singly identifiable act, often means that they are able to confront themselves that we ourselves often like support these kind of racist institutions themselves. At the, time, at the point in time we are able to get them to recognize the problem, we think that's where active efforts will actually create to change that particular problem. That's the unique extension we bring from closing government. Let's explain, then let's go on to rebuttals about what OO said. One, notice that the big part of our opening opposition said was the idea, for example, that we must add capacity to these schools, which presumably means that white Americans have the ability to opt out of this school. This is not true. Schools close up all the time. It is possible for us, for us to create new schools and still teach, for example, Afrocentric mm -hmm. curriculums in the first place. Surely, for example, the number of schools that teach this will increase. But secondly, notice, for example, in America, admissions to schools is largely based on geographic area. Yellows glibly say this that look, people will move if they want to. This is not true. One, moving has massive financial penalties. To the point in time that it costs a lot of money to move, I don't think individuals have that kind of money. Notice, for example, we're talking about public schools. Yes, rich Americans can avoid this because they have the geographic mobility to one, send their kids to private schools and move anyway. But to the point in time that they don't solve this problem, I don't understand how that helps. But sec uh, we think that poor individuals, for example, will be forced to stay. The second reason is that moving often costs a huge amount of personal cost to you. You are outputting your family and all those emotional connections that go on with them. Many individuals don't have the ability to do so. <coughs> yes, we acknowledge that our policy has flaws. That is true. But at the point in time that it still reaches the majority of Americans and teaches them, for example, that this is what racism actually looks like in this status quo, we think that we do more good in this debate. For all those reasons, we're proud to propose.
start with a few preliminary housekeeping points. I think it's important to just clean, up, clean this up. Our understanding of government policy is this. They are going to use government resources to fund and build schools, presumably that focuses on what they call ACS. That's fine, and presumably that participates the question how do we best use resources in the states to achieve political goals in the state. In opposition's point of view, and especially in CEO, we're happy to do three particular things in the alternative, just so we know where the opposition line stands. One, we're happy to instead fund pedagogy that focuses on more liberal values that move forward, and also yeah, right, key yeah. points of American history that can range from anything, like Martin Luther King, all the way to Barack Obama, all black figures and white figures, in some degree of proportionality, whatever. Second, we're happy to suggest that funding can be made to and for people to make sure that predominantly they are, they are predominantly black, to make sure that they get into education, so we change perceptions and how they useful and how fun and useful they are. Society. Third of all, we're also, likely to have, we're also happy to increase the ability of, to, of funding pedagogy that focuses against more liberal values like racism or party racism as a whole. The distinction, therefore, and the thread that I think you can see between the two policies is simply this, no less. First, that an opposition bill against schooling systems that inherently promote a degree of segregation just matter of practical necessity coming out on the government's bench. I'll explain what this means in a moment. But second, we are also especially happy in CEO to promote systems of education or schooling that, doesn't, that isn't founded on backward-looking retrospective criterions or backward-looking retrospective cultures that move society forward as a whole, even if it must be to make America great again. First, why does the government policy, and the first extension is why the government policy inherently doesn't work? Their premise is this. Society is in a pretty fucked up place, and one that inherently discriminates society will affect individuals more and more. CG's extension is to say that this is really, really bad, give more visualization how this works, and then explain why letting white people internalize why they're racist is inherently good. I'm not going to dispute that, I'm only going to dispute the mechanism that none of the gov gov uh, debaters were able to explain, which is simply this. What it came down to is that we need to make people who currently don't see racism as being an illegitimate thing legitimate, or this concept legitimate. And the problem that the gov has refused to accept is their policy inherently means that at least at the very start, because the premise that they're working with, black people will go to these African-centric schools and white people will go to others. That's what Wilson admitted in his first speech to begin with, and I think that's a fair reasonable assumption. That's why inevitably, the starting point of the GAPS policy is the degree of segregation. The question I posed to multiple speakers on their side, no thank you, is how does this normalize to a point that they want to achieve when white people start entering these particular schools? We got a few responses, not coming from closing, most coming from Bihar. Most of this is this. First, mere existence of these types of values is sufficient enough. There is no greater antithesis to this concept of existence equally equate to legitimacy than the black problem itself. Black people exist, the discrimination exists, it doesn't mean that they get any more legitimate day by day. No thank you. The next best thing they said is, oh, when liberal parents exist, teaching a system of education and pedagogy that focuses on one particular value is not liberal, Madam Chair. Focusing on one perspective that focuses on one group of individuals and one culture is not liberal. And we suggest that liberal parents in today's world are not going to put their children into a system that looks retrospectively at goals that wants to otherwise individual groups, even if it's for the benefit of one particular group at the end of the day. That is why we don't believe that anyone in the government bench has explained how they bridge the gap. What they needed to do was to explain how you get these white people that they hated on so much into these black schools. At the end of the day, they didn't, okay. and they faced no thank you. The practical challenge is this, Madam Chair, which is simply that we're talking about public schools. And the reality is, they didn't explain how these ACS public schools are going to compare against other public schools, who are equally as cheap, equally as attractive options to white people that they see are ingrained with ideals that cannot be changed. The question then is this, if the entire government says that the current system is messed up, surely it must have been the burden of some government speaker to explain to us how we change the incentive of parents financially and the on a practical scale that we move these individuals away from a predominant system that they want to perform is inherently bad. Short of any of these particular arguments, their inherent concession by practicalities means that they're happy to accept the reality that these kinds of, report, that these kinds of necklaces that they reported as the underlying premise of their entire dark case will continue to happen, save mechanism that none of them explain. No, thank you. Why then is it important to recover narratives that are different? The thing is, we haven't looked really at all this Afrocentrism really is. And the reality is, if their policy is going to work, it must be backward looking. It must look back at the horrors that people thought has happened. It must look back at the heroes that they say have overcome this. Which means, no, thank you, if it means taking away or choosing against perhaps a more liberal white hero that's reported liberal values in today's day age, they will choose one who's performed other values in the past simply because he is black. No explanation for why this is a better um, alternative in any of the cases. Opening. Yeah, so historically, black co colleges and universities 
large part of the American system today that prioritize ecocentric views and don't have any of the harms in place. Why is extending this policy to lower levels of education? To we'll start this uh, discussion earlier, a right, bad thing. That's fine, and that's exactly our policy. We're having to say that's a matter of, of allocating government resources. That's exactly the ops case. And that's why the preliminary analysis of what the realities of both sides are needed to be had. Because it was convenient for the government to think that we couldn't change what we should use government resources for. The question that they needed to explain as a burden of opposition is why this is particularly useful use of, 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 of resources on the state, to which we haven't seen an efficient answer in terms of mechanism. But past that, we are happy in CEO to support no, thank you, a policy that's one that we see already today, that many pedagogies are already moving towards binding systems that are beneficial for society. And we think we accept that what he has tried to say in opposition, perhaps the government, is this that the many sufferings and the horrors are inherently galvanizing of a community that wants to move forward. And we accept that. The thing is that in today's society in today's days, no thank you, we are no we have no shortage of terrible tragedies that are galvanizing in and of itself. But more importantly, they are galvanizing in a way that doesn't have to essentialize or have to emphasize race and culture, Madam Chair. From everything like 9 11 to the 2008 financial crisis where all races suffered equally, to even Trump's election just recently, all of these things are more fundamental to the ways Americans are as a society collectively, as opposed to focusing on inherent races. And we think that moving forward, moving away from perspectives or pedagogies that are retrospective in nature, are far more binding because you're able to create the narrative in which we think a culture, a community and society should formulate the blocks of that particular and, uh, uh, society as a whole and ingrain it within the, the youth of that particular nation. We think that the success of these particular systems is actually seen on the back of the kinds of success that we see new media have in, 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 in binding all different communities against, uh, uh, regardless of race. The point here is that given this current progression towards a race-blind society that doesn't see the need to distinguish, these segregated schools, which are inherent, practical, and resolved in their case, are antithetical to that particular unity that we see today. And that is why we cannot stand for a case that, has, that is one that is retrospectively looking, doesn't offer anything unique in terms of what the teaching pedagogy that we can't give you in opposition either, but most importantly, disrupts a unified society that is currently trying to bond against the tragedy that we see today. That's what I mean. has been lauding this idea of segregation over our heads, but that this policy was somehow seemingly out. Let me tell you the reality of America right now. America is already segregated. Public schools and schools are already like segregated anyway, right? Like for example, even in like places, if you go to like poor neighborhoods like in the Bronx or even places in Chicago or New Orleans, for example, those schools are already intensely segregated, right? Like we don't see why this is a specific problem because that th that problem also exists on their side. The only difference therefore becomes as to what is actually being taught in those schools and what kind of environments do those schools operate on. That is what they needed to prove to us, which they didn't inherently do so. So we don't really get this sort of premise that comes up from the entire op opposition branch. I'll respond to a few things from uh, like uh, CG's, CO's extension, and then I'll talk about two broad issues that they use. Extension first. What did, they, what did they tell us, right? They told us on their side, or they are some, some, some counter model, that they're somehow going to fund some sort of liberal like pedagogy, and somehow it's going to be neutral. It's not very like dissimilar from oh, it's kind of the same thing anyway. But here's the response, right? Like the problem, as we outlined earlier in like uh, in CD, right? That at the point in time where your history is centered mostly around like white individuals and, and seeing them as heroes means that a lot of white students and black students who go to these schools often correlate the idea of America being an extremely white country even though it's often formed on the origins of immigrants, right? This is the current problem that we've been trying to solve for like 
things like time memorial, and we don't think that their site necessarily makes this go away, right? This, this sort of somehow seemingly liberal pedagogy does not necessarily allow you to experience the full extent of like American history. The second thing that they told us, like they, they told us that our site was extremely backward looking, but like, that is what history is. History essentially yeah. is looking at the past and understanding how things in the past affected the way things are right now. So on their side of the house, that's going to happen anyway. But secondly and more importantly, the unique benefit of Afrocentric history is to tell you that the history of America is bathed in the blood of racism and oppression and you cannot avoid this when thinking about how America is what it is today. That is the entire extension that we told you, which they completely ignored and gave an extremely glib response to. Thirdly, they, we, thirdly, right, we also told you that the problem here is that with current public schools, there are intense geographic constraints, which means that it's hard for you to intently like segregate yourself as you currently can in the status quo, because like right now, this presumably this policy is funded for and created by the government. This means this also, this also responds to opening options idea that this will somehow be second class schools or that history is alternative history. Because when the government is, when the state government is legitimizing these schools, right, that's a strong enough signal to show that these schools are legitimate schools. We also presume that they have like reasonably like good teachers to mention that the school is a good school. We don't really see a problem with the type of mechanism that they want to talk about. The last thing I'll say about like uh, closing off, right, before we want to broad issues in the debate, is if is, is the fact that if Closing opposition doesn't dispute that a problem exists. They must also explain how they are like able to solve the problem. It's not enough for them to just say that we like a uh, gov doesn't fully like solve the problem. Even if you don't fully solve the problem, you solve it to an extent where at least black and or African American kids can feel proud about their history and they have role models to look up to. If that is the least amount of benefit that we can get on their side, which cannot be gained on opposition, we think that is still something that is preferable. But the last thing about opposition where they glibly told us was that they told us issues like social like inequality or things like the recession affects everyone equally. No, that is not true, right? The 2008 financial financial recession like significantly affected African American families much more because like they were the ones who suffered exactly. most under the capitalist system. Like even Hurricane Katrina affected a lot of black families because the government refused to build projects in New Orleans. So don't come up to me and tell me that somehow these issues like affect people equally, right? They affect people on a different scale, which is why we need Afrocentric history for people to understand the systemic oppression that's taken place on one particular group of people. Two other things I want to talk about in this debate, right? How does this necessarily affect like the idea of segregation? What it actually means to go to a heterocentric school? We think it's very we think for kids, right? A lot of school kids often spend more time in school than they do at home, right? Which is something that we told you. The reason why it's very important for African American kids is because for them, right? It, oftentimes when they're in public schools, they often feel alienated because they don't really have anyone to look up to, right? That was a point of our extension. We told you that giving them a glimpse of history and telling them that of black excellence that shrouded throughout America means that these individuals are more easily able to understand how oppression affected them and that also affects their interaction with those other individuals. The reason why this is also important is because this has a spillover effect, right? Opposition seems to claim that the, the education here is going to remain within those schools. No, we don't think so. And here's why our extension then is particularly important. We the impact of this is that we are able to gain greater source of political capital for like black issues to be heard on the screen, right? After these schools are proposed, do you not think like the, like the media, for example, is going to report on these things? Do you not think like like groups like the ACLU, for example, they come and lobby congressmen for like to uh, like for like policies that affect African Americans? We think those are all things which can be done due to the creation of these schools and it creates some sort of discourse. Opening government only asserts and tells you that these Afrocentric schools are lead to good yeah, outcomes, yeah. but we we went much further and told you what those specific outcomes were and how it not only affects the African American community, it also affects everyone outside of that bubble as well. These Afrocentric schools do not exist in a bubble, Madam Chair, but it affects everyone else because after an African American goes to these schools and steps out of these schools, his perception of the world will be largely different and we think that's a good thing, right? Because if it means that he comes out an 18 year old, like brave, like confident young black man or woman who's willing to do what it takes to like to like uh, progress themselves socially, we think those are all good outcomes for African American individuals. We think it also affects the way in which they talk to their white counterparts, right? It's harder to also like uh, assume that racism doesn't exist when there's an entire conversation happening in the country about the fact that specific schools are teaching curriculums that center on Afrocentrism. It becomes harder for people to assume that a problem exists. This also relates to the white fragility problem that we talk about, right? Yeah. People can no longer deny that they are not racist or they can no longer deny that racism doesn't exist because it's shown right in front of their faces and we think that is the best way to confront these individuals, yes. If schools are if public schools are allocated based on geography, the only kinds of states that will have and introduce this kind of ACS schools are schools that are densely populated with black people. Okay, we think that's like still a good thing because that if that means that like 
more African American parents send their kids to school, we think that's a good thing, number one. Secondly, we also think that if this also means that African American parents are like more confident in getting their kids to grow up and like have a full sort of education, they also do so. The problem with status quo, which they still haven't responded to, by the way, is that a lot of African American parents sometimes pull their kids out of school early because they see that there's no point or value in going to these schools. We change this somewhat to some extent when you have Afrocentric schools because this means that these students feel more at home, these students also have a community which like they can feel comfortable with, and these students also have the ability to come out of the world wanting to be confident and better person. The last thing that I will say is that Afrocentrism is also important because it's important for individuals to understand that the history of America is flawed, right? That America is not a perfect country, that the state itself has gone against, like, use, it, use the levers of oppression to affect one particular systemic group. The moment we realize this is the moment we start having true conversation about what it means to be an African American in the United States of America. Until then, we don't think blacks or whites are necessarily going to be able to, like, come together. We don't think they're going to be able to, be able to understand the issues. We need to take away the veil that racism does not exist. I'm very, very proud of the group also. The fundamental problem beside closing government is that they are superb when it comes to identification of problems but horribly inadequate when it comes to solutions. Jipping was right when he talked about how white adults generally have a very narrow view of racism that is probably a singular deliberate immoral act rather than how well-meaning people, people who are moral, can actually subliminally contribute to an overall atmosphere of racist attitude. But what is this? His solution is to have more unrecognizable figures, Africans who may not even be Americans, and are to be studied apart. The question is, most of the time, the problem is that people do not want to interpret the world with their minds. They want to interpret the world with their hearts. They never really realize that the very bigots that the history is talking about applies to themselves. Because like what he correctly pointed out, inherently, we are often very defensive of our history, not because we are defensive for the sake of being defensive, but because the people that form this history are our very forefathers. People who themselves are victims, people who themselves have made certain sacrifices, and people whom we ultimately feel the closest affinity, uh, affinity with. With that particular understanding, there is a reason why the race line policy, the kinds of inclusive platforms that we want to have, is so incredibly important. The second problem they identified is that, look, segregation already exists. The whole problem, the demographic time bomb already exists. Listen to the language. It is important to recognize that segregation is the biggest problem, the elephant in this room here. Governments have tried tremendously to like, reshape demographics across populations, specifically children who are being sent to schools over there. Their particular policy is going to regress on every single initiative the government has done. Why is that the case? Firstly, because black parents will now feel that it is their obligation to send their children to a, to a school that teaches more about their particular history. And even if they truly appreciate the whole value of integration, i.e. they see the trade-off, if I were to send my child to an uh, uh, ACS school in this particular case, it will probably mean that he will probably just be interacting with the rest of the best. He will lose out on every opportunity to like, interact with the whites. Even if they can make that assessment on the individual level, the peer pressure from their fellow African uh, uh, American parents across the road is probably going to mean that as a part of the community, I should still try to defend my own core, uh, core group of values. When these kinds of democratic alteration rest on fundamental interests of these parents, we realize that the worst case scenario is a lot more likely to happen in their particular sure. policy. But most importantly, I really wanted to ask CG this question, so I'm going to give them a PY later. Is okay. that are you willing to defend Wilson's uh, model of drastically changing the demographics as well as the structures of school? I fire all the white, uh, white, white, white teach, uh, teachers replace all their textbooks and then have uh, explicitly tell these children that as a state policy because we want to restart this social engineering process we want to teach you about uh, uh, unfamiliar African Ameri uh, 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 Africans just because we will get you to learn more about the history Can say yes or no? You're not going to answer. You're not going to answer. Probably, as the, as, the, as, the, as the judging rules mean that you probably will have to have that portion of your case deducted. <laughs>
No, thank you. So let's talk about opening uh, government. What is Wilson's lie? Wilson's lie is that the reason why that policy may pos possibly work is because of some form of crossing over. That means whites may accidentally send their children to these ACS schools, and then blacks, as a reciprocal effect, may accidentally send their children towards uh, to these white schools. Guys, when the textbooks are being changed, when all the staff is being changed, and perhaps the parents may have some subliminal racism or mistrust towards these parents. When the parents, the fundamental interest is that they do not want their children to be used as social ring battering reps. They do not want their schools to be a better ground that the state is purposely manipulating education towards certain social aims to change the way they vote. This kind of accidental exchange will never happen. Then Vihar came up with a better response in response to my PUI, right? which is that actually the purpose of their policy is to make blacks no longer feel like minorities in their own backyard. Given their best case scenario, let me firstly say two things. Firstly, two wrongs clearly don't make a right. Yes, it is wrong that blacks feel like minorities in their own backyard, but your policy is not to reverse it by making whites feel like minorities in their own backyard by making, increasing the concentration of African Americans within a certain school and hoping that they will accidentally send their white children into those schools. But more importantly, this is the precise creation of ghettos, right? Because these blacks will now try to uh, group together to artificially feel empowered. But the real demoralization really happens when they have to go out to the real world to look for jobs, to actually interact with the rest of the people, to fund political parties, to fund political campaigns. That is the important part because they realize that at the end of the day, if anything significant is going to be made, you need an important white by him. That's why Obama's election process is so important because he managed to use white levers of power, white popular support, and still got into power in uh, using these kinds of situations. So for all these reasons, let's talk about constructive case coming from closing the opposition. No, thank you. We are very clear. We want a buying system that emphasizes inclusivity. It may be a little slower but at least it is race blind. But most importantly, if specific, uh, specifically, oh, yeah, yeah. no, no. Specifically speaking, we are saying that in the event whereby we have to choose between two historical figures that is going to be placed in our textbook, we would rather choose leaders that people can recognize and have an affinity to. And yes, it is true that many of them will be white. Yes, it is true that they are history makers because they also have an unfair advantage of controlling the levers of power. But at the very least, people can still feel that kind of authenticity towards the kinds of contribution that the white leaders have made. And they can also appreciate that at certain junctures, like for example Abraham Lincoln, they came to points of enlightenment towards greater inclusivity, towards greater reciprocity, i.e. the concept of how if my white people have their rights, the black people also should have a similar level of rights. Maybe not exactly the same, but a similar level of rights. And mind you, in that particular historical narrative, we also are proud to include the prominent blacks in this case. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, every example they talked about. The difference is this, is that at the very least, there is no sense of engineering on the set of the government. And this is important because the moment the whites feel that the, the control of history is being taken away, they fall prey to this victimizing idea, i.e. they feel that they are strangers in their own backyard. It's a history that has been disfigured that they cannot recognize. For all those reasons, I'm sure.